Today's uh, title of the sermon you have in the bulletin is probably up on the screen as well as the barren fig tree. This is not one of the most popular of the parables of Jesus. And uh, actually in a couple of weeks from now, we're also going to be talking on the unfaithful servant, which is probably the worst one that we think of when we think of the parables of Jesus, or one of the most difficult, let's put it that way. This can be difficult if we really look at it, and that's what we're going to do this morning. It's in Luke's gospel. The uh, parable doesn't start till the sixth verse, but there's something before that that's very important. So we're going to be reading verses one through nine from the Living Bible this morning. About this time, he was informed that Pilate had butchered some Jews from Galilee as they were sacrificing at the temple in Jerusalem. Do you think that they were worse sinners than other men from Galilee, he asked? Is that why they suffered? Not at all. And don't you realize that you also will perish unless you leave your evil ways and turn to God? And what about the 18 men who died when the Tower of Shalom fell on them? Were they the worst sinners in Jerusalem? No, nah, not at all. And you too will perish unless you repent. Then he used this illustration. A man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if he could find any fruit on it, but he was always disappointed. Finally, he told his gardener to cut it down. I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig, he said. Why bother with it any longer? It's taking up space we could use for something else. Give it one more chance, the gardener answered. Leave it another year, and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs next year, fine. If not, I'll cut it down. God's word to us today, parable of the fig tree. Now, the parable of the barren fig tree, of course, is one of the stories of Jesus. What is he trying to say to us today? And we need to remind ourselves, of course, that whenever we move into any of the parables, we are getting close to Jesus. That's what I like about the parables. It's almost as if we look out into the world through his eyes and see what he saw and understand in a new way what he's trying to say. So for the next few minutes, I hope you're just, you're just really ready to, to get close to Jesus. And another thing we want to do is to remind ourselves that how many of the parables tell us about God about who God is, about what God's like, and especially the grace of God, the grace of God, the love of God. And for Jesus, of course, that's the bottom line. That's the baseline. This is the thing of which everything else is built. Our relationship with God is literally everything, everything. Our whole life, our wholeness of life, our strength and ability to live in the world and to care for other people and to be peacemakers and whatever else we feel to be called to do, all of this depends on our relationship with God. And so many of the parables tell us about who this God is, who is our life. And in his parables, we discover that God loves us. But not just that loves us. I mean, we've heard that all of our lives till the, the point where we don't hear it anymore. The mother asked her little boy about Sunday school. What did you learn in Sunday school today? Oh, he loves us kids. You know, I've heard that every, every week mom, you know, and for some of us, we've heard it so often, we haven't heard it. But what we learn in these parables is that God is loving us 
passionately, intensely, urgently. It just comes through in so many ways. The fact that the, that the parables in Luke's gospel are in what we call the travel document. That's when Jesus is traveling. He's on his way to Jerusalem, traveling there to die. And so there's a sense of urgency in the stories in Luke 15, especially. And the repetition that you find in Luke 15, for example, the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son, and over and over and over again, Jesus is telling the same thing. And as we read the stories, we begin to get the sense of this passionate involvement. The woman, for example, turned her house upside down, didn't she? For her desire to find that coin that she had lost. And Jesus is telling us that God turns our house upside down, trying to get through to us, trying to love us. And the story of the lost son, the longing, the tremendous longing of the father's heart, wanting his sons to come to him because really both of the boys were lost to him. The younger boy and all of his rebellion and the older boy and his uptightness his kind of legalistic obedience, if you will. And he wanted those boys to come home. He wanted to be able to love both of them. And we feel that longing in that parable. And it's very helpful for us to experience God's love in this way, not just up in our head, not just talking about the love of God, as an intellectual thing or a theological concept, but to feel it, actually feel ourselves being loved more passionately than we will ever know from a human being in all of our lives. To know that at this moment, think about this now, while you're sitting in that pew, God is loving us that way. God is longing for us to come home. God is longing for us to find life through this love, through this grace. And this is so important. It's almost as if it spills out over into every one of his stories that Jesus told. I mean, it's even here in this parable. And I bet you, you didn't even see it. That's why we like to go deeper into these parables. I bet you didn't even notice it. The barren fig tree, even though I don't think this is the point of the story about all this stuff, but the man planted the fig tree and he kept going to it and he was looking for fruit. I mean, why wouldn't you? For three years, I mean, he had patience. That's a lot of patience. And it was running out. And that it was beyond anyone's else wild imagination to go that far. And he did his patience and his endurance. So he tells the vine dresser, dig it out. Get rid of it. But the vine dresser says, Sir, give it one more year. You see, there it is. There's the grace. Did you catch it? There's the grace. The year of grace. One more year. Give it another chance. Just go all the way with it. All the way with giving it a chance. And you feel that grace again. Even in this parable. The fact that God is offering us life and loving us so passionately and intensely, wanting us to be whole, wanting us to be able to minister, to love other persons, and to the world around us. God wants that for us passionately. But I don't even think that's the point of the parable. 
But it's very important, I think, for us to be clear about this. That God is so gracious that he gives us freedom. I mean, we're not like the fig tree in this sense. The fig tree's purpose was to bear figs. And really, it's all determined by its nature to do this or not do it. But people have freedom. We are free to make a response to God to say yes or no to the love of God. And everything depends on this. Everything depends on this response that we make. Great story of a devout country preacher. They asked him to find the doctrine of election the theological doctrine of election. And he said, well, you all know what election is, don't you? We elect a president, we elect a governor, and in the kingdom of God, there is always an election going on, but just three votes are cast. God always votes for you, the devil votes against you, and you have the deciding vote. Well, some of the parables are about this deciding vote. Well, what about this parable then? It's almost deceptively simple and clear and obvious. The owner of the vineyard planted the tree, cultivated it, cared for it, and had every right to expect fruit from it. God cultivates us. God plants us, God waters us, God nourishes us, and God has every right to expect fruit, the fruit that he expects of a good God-centered life, a certain kind of life, a certain kind of activity, a certain kind of thoughts, a certain way of being that we are associated with our relationship with God. And God has a right to expect that fruit. And one of the things about the parable that is so important is, is that it gets us out of the realm of talking theology and escaping up into our heads and reflecting and thinking. And Now, all of this can be important. There's nothing wrong with that, but they can also be ways of of escaping our responsible obedience to God, too. I know in my own case, I often love to escape into my head as long as I can think about something and theologize about something and debate something. And this very parable, we're in danger of doing that here. I mean, we're talking about it right now. We'll be thinking about it. But I think that's to miss the point of the parable. This parable is about doing. It's about producing the fruit. You either produce the fruit or you don't. And as human persons with the gift of freedom, you have that choice. You can choose to say yes to God or no to God by the quality of the fruit that you produce with your life the things that you do, the person who you are. Do you remember that hit song? Probably don't, but there was a hit song in the Broadway musical, My Fair Lady. And it's almost as if God is is kind of singing that song to us. Some of the words are, don't talk of stars burning above. If you're in love, show me. Sing me no song, read me no rhyme, Don't waste my time, show me. Don't talk of June, don't talk of fall, don't talk at all, show me. Well, that is what God is saying to us through this parable. Just show me. And one of the most striking things about this parable is the sense of urgency that is here. Jesus introduces the parable in the 13th chapter of Luke's gospel by telling a story of some Galileans 
who were killed by Pilate's soldiers. You remember that in the first part of the scripture? While they were making sacrifices in the temple. And then he tells about the 18 people who died when the Tower of Shalom fell and killed them. And Jesus says, unless you repent, unless you change, unless you bear fruit, you will likewise perish. But what is he really saying here? He's really saying that if these people would have had a warning ahead of time about what was going to happen, they could have escaped their tragic deaths. But Jesus is saying, John the Baptist has warned you. I have warned you. Listen. And then this parable is like part of that warning. So can you see the urgency that's there? But there's another place where the urgency comes into it also, and it's striking. This is one of the deep parts of the parable that people don't like. In the Middle East, when folks cut down a tree, they didn't cut it down at ground level like we do here and let the roots just kind of rot out. They dig it out, roots and all, total destruction. And that appears twice in this parable. First, the owner of the vineyard said to the vine dresser, dig it out, cut it out. And then the vine dresser says, let it alone for a year. If it bears fruit, great. But if it doesn't, then I'll dig it out. What is it really saying is if we don't bear fruit, we will be totally destroyed. So the image of that adds a note of urgency to the parable, doesn't it? And right now at this very moment, we already know some things we need to give up or some things that we need to add to our lives in order to bear the kind of fruit that God expects of us, don't we? I bet you we can, if we think hard enough. Story of a pastor who visited a weaving factory and the foreman gave him a tour. And the pastor said, oh, I see one of my members over there, John Atkins. He says, he's a great man, great worker in the church, very faithful. I bet you he's a fine weaver. And the foreman said, well, honestly, Reverend, he's not a very good weaver at all. I mean, he comes in here, he stands around, he's always talking about his religion. He's a good man, and I'm sure he could be a good weaver, but John needs to learn that when he punches into his job, his religion should come out of his fingers and not his mouth. Well, this is that kind of parable. It's an emphasis on the religious Things coming out of our fingers, coming out of the way we live, the fruit that we bear. But for some of us, there's still a question. What are the fruits, Reverend? Tell me. I want to know. Well, I've already suggested that if we really think about it, we know. (laughs) We know some things that we need to give up or add to our life. We know that there are some things we have to do now in order to be fruitful. But if you need a list, Paul shares a list of the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Now, there's other places in the New Testament, but Galatians 5 lists things for us. They're there for you. But how did Jesus prepare the disciples to help them understand what the fruit is? He talked about prayer. He spent a great deal of time working with them on prayer, even giving them that model prayer. Story of a man who's complaining to a friend. He says, my wife always wants money. Always. Day before yesterday, she wanted $20. Yesterday, she wanted $15. Today, she wants $25. And the friend says, what does she want with all of that money? He says, I don't know. I don't give her any. Well, it's almost as if God is asking for us time in prayer 
every day. And somebody may ask, what does God want with all that prayer time? And many of us would have to answer, I don't know. I don't give him any. Perhaps the best thing to come out of this time together this morning is that you would be praying more. And the other thing that Jesus worked on a great deal with his disciples was compassion. And before this week is over, beloved, I'm sure we will have the opportunity through some specific concrete act of compassion to bear the fruit, if you will, to let God find joy in the way in which we love others. Okay? A husband and wife were discussing the possibilities of going to the Holy Land. And he said, wouldn't it be fantastic to be able to go to the Holy Land and stand on Mount Sinai and shout the Ten Commandments? And she said, honey, you know what? I think it would be even better if we stayed at home and kept them. The parable of the barren fig tree is a parable which Jesus clearly, clearly is telling us to stay at home and produce great fruit. Wow. Amen.